Hey guys and welcome to Taylor Tech. Today we're going to take a look at real 10 gigabit networking at home. Now you may have previously watched the uh, 10 gigabit peer-to-peer -peer network where we talked about connecting two machines together and creating just this one little local usage for that 10 gigabit network. But what if you have several computers? What if you have three or four computers you want to connect together? You need some way for all those clients to interconnect through a single device. And that's what we have here a 10 gigabit switch from Cisco. So let's talk about how I found this guy, how I implemented it at home in my network, um, and how I got it set up in the first place, because uh, this type of equipment is not the easiest thing in the world to set up. It's not plug and play like your basic unmanaged switch that you may be familiar with. So if you want to go for full 10 gigabit networking at home, you have to understand that not only are you competing with all the other consumers in the market, this is still stuff that is actively used by enterprises. These kinds of this kind of gear, especially in home friendly format, is not going to be cheap, guys. Uh, you know, the new list price for most uh, sw 10 gigabit switches starts in the you know $500 range and goes all the way up to what you would spend on a small car. You need to think about that very carefully, exactly how much are you willing to spend and uh, you know what kind of performance are you wanting out of your network. Now, if you're like me, you got to have 10 gigabit and it's just got to work the whole way, all clients 10 gigabit. Um, but you also don't have hundreds and hundreds of dollars to throw at a single device. Uh, so um, eBay and Craigslist are under the rescue on this again. Um, there are several different models of switch you can look for. Um, this one is a Cisco UCS 6120 XP, which is part of their universal compute system. Um, there's also the relative right now, at least in you know fall of 2017, it's pretty easy to find the Cisco Nexus uh, 5K switches. Um, in 5K switches, are like the 5010 and the uh, 5020, which is a bigger switch with more ports. Um, there's also the Quanta LB6M, which uh, you can find out there, although I've heard the Quantas are um, very difficult to find documentation for. The Cisco ones, at least, it's pretty easy to find the documentation online for them. In terms of price, you need to expect to spend at least $100, probably more like three or $400, um, depending on the features and quality of the switch. Um, the other thing you need to expect is the form factor. This is a full depth rack mount switch and so is the n5k and so is the quanta so don't expect to have something that's going to be small and sit on your shelf um, even the like nice consumer ones that are in that low end 500 dollars range are 19 inch rack mount switches um, they just are a little bit smaller form factor and are more convenient to have in a household due to their power draw and their noise now that brings me to some thing that we need to discuss next if you want to go this route you need to consider the downsides of using old 10 gigabit enterprise switching gear. So number one, it uses a lot of power. Um, all of the switches we talked about are going to draw between 200 and 300 watts at idle and up to 500 watts, which, which is as much as you know your average gaming rig at full tilt. So consider that that's going to be a lot of energy that's being pulled constantly, assuming you leave the switch on. Um, for me, where I live, this and for this switch, which draws about 300 watts at idle, I'm expecting my power bill to go up by about 20 to $30 a month. Um, that's no small piece of change, but considering the price difference between this guy, which I got for 60 bucks, and yeah, I got a good deal, and um, the next, you know, the, the next cheapest low power draw item, it's gonna take over two and a half years for this to pull enough power to have made the other switch make sense financially. The second thing to consider is that they are loud. And I'm not talking like, and I'm not talking like, oh, my gaming rig is spun up loud. I'm talking like, I need hearing protection loud. Well, maybe not quite hearing protection, but it's not gonna be comfortable to sit in a room with, especially a small room. I'm in a pretty big, about 1500 square foot unfinished basement. I have lots of room that I can shove this thing to the other end of the basement and I can hear it, but it's not annoying me. If you're in a situation where it's going to be in the closet right next door or it's going to be sitting in the room with you, this is probably not going to work out that well for you. You may be saying to yourself, wait, Taylor, that's not that loud. I'm, uh, we've got the microphone right in front of it and it's just... Yeah, there you go. Once the fans actually kick on, it's pretty damn loud. The third thing to consider is that the 
these switches are generally going to be pretty obtuse when it comes to figuring out how to set them up. Uh, the Cisco ones, from what I've seen, have pretty decent documentation online, and there is a pretty big community around Cisco gear in general, so you will be able to find some people to help you out. Um, if you get stuck, although they may not be able to answer every question for you because a lot of this stuff is pretty specialized. Um, the, you know, the Quantas, as we talked about, the documentation is pretty sparse. It's hard to find for them. Um, and the community is even smaller. The only people who really use them at this point are people doing these kinds of projects at home. You know, you're, you're going to be a bit on your own. You're going to have to break out the, uh, the console cable and getting into the command line of the switch to be able to actually set them up. So let's talk about this switch real quick. Uh, so like I said at the beginning, this is a Cisco UCS 6120XP. It's part of their universal compute system. Uh, it boasts 20 uh, SFP plus ports in the back. Uh, in addition, it has a module bay, which I currently have a uh, four gigabit ethernet or four ethernet, four fiber channel uh, module in. And uh, it, I, if I remember the spec sheet correctly, it has up to 320 gigabytes per second of switching capacity, which means all ports on the switch can be going at full tilt the entire time. Um, and it draws 300 or so watts at idle, up to 550 watts at full tilt. It's loud as a jet engine, and it's one of the most difficult things I've ever tried to set up, uh, especially considering that the documentation for it was actually a little bit difficult for me to find at first until I really understood what this thing really is. Because it looks like a switch, but it's not a switch. But it is a switch, but it's not a switch. And finally, uh, something to consider that you need to be careful about, with Cisco at least, is that uh, Cisco likes to keep you in the Cisco family um, when it comes to anything related to the switch, and or <clears throat> when it comes to anything related to Cisco gear. So generally speaking, when you buy your SFP Plus modules, Cisco is going to want you to have Cisco modules, not somebody else's modules and it can sometimes throw a fit. Fortunately, that is not the case on this guy. Um, I was able to use the cables that I got with my Mellanox uh, cards that are for Mellanox, and they worked fine with this switch without any additional configuration. So let's talk about what made this thing difficult to set up real quick. Um, there are three things ultimately that I've learned about this switch that uh, had I known them beforehand, I might have considered one of the Nexus, uh, Cisco Nexus 5110 or 5010s instead. Um, the first is that this isn't really a switch. It looks like a switch, but it's not really a switch. What it is is actually the management module for the Cisco Unified Compute System, um, which includes their Rack Mount and Blade Server System. And it's designed to uh, work with an additional unit of the same type for complete redundancy in networking and, and management capabilities of uh, their server system. But while the hardware is capable of switching and is essentially the same hardware as uh, the 5010s that we talked about, the software in it is a lot more complicated and uh, a lot more difficult to dig through. Um, and one of the things that was actually difficult in terms of finding documentation for it is it's not under the model number of the switch, it's under uh, UCS management. Uh, so it took me a while to actually figure out this is the documentation I need to be looking at. Another thing is that this is not a plug and play switch. You can't just put the power in, plug your SFP plus cables in and go. You actually have to manually configure every single port in the switch. Those ports need licensing, which you may or may not have if you're buying it used. And if you don't have those licenses, you're pretty much shit out of luck because the licenses cost about $1,200 a piece. So technically this thing does actually have a GUI that you can use to set it up and you don't have to use the command line interface. Um, but I was never able to get it to work. I used my console cable to do the initial setup and get the management port provisioned and then try to go into the management interface, but uh, it's Java based. It didn't like the version of Java I had installed. It didn't like the fact that the security certificate installed on this guy is out of date now. And it didn't like, uh, something about the login process would cause it to fail and get say it had a bad URL. So basically I was shit out of luck on using the, uh, the, the GUI, the web-based GUI, um, and I had to revert to just doing everything by console. However, once I did find the documentation for this switch and I figured out how to navigate the command line and I figured out that it wasn't really a switch but it was actually a management module for uh, a compute system, it became a lot easier to navigate the thing and realize what it was I needed to do. While it took me almost a week and a half to get it set up the first time, 
to verify that I actually understood what I did, I actually did a factory reset on it and then did the setup again and it only took me about 15 minutes. So it's really one of those things, if you know what you're doing, it's not that bad, although it can be a little bit difficult the first time. To help anybody else out there who picked themselves up a 6120 XP and wondered what the hell is going on with this thing, I'll go through the setup process here in a little bit, but I um, just want to give you an overview of what that was like from my end. So I want to talk real quick about the things you'll need when you're setting this guy up. Um, first of all, uh, you when you get the switch, you may or may not have power cables. It uses standard um, universal power cables, not a big deal. Um, you may or may not get some SFP Plus modules with it, depending on the seller and how nice they are. My seller said I didn't get any, and then he threw two in for free. Thank you, seller. Um, and you're going to need cables to hook those modules together. So you can just get some um, LC to LC fiber optic cable. This is OM3 cable, which uh, lets me run it out about 300 meters between that and the, uh, the uh, short uh, range adapt uh, SFP plus modules. You also need a console cable. So what that is, is a cable that's got an RJ45 port on one end and either a serial port or a USB port on the other. I picked up one that had a USB port on it so that I could just plug it directly into any USB device. And what it'll do is it'll show up as a COM device, uh, like a serial COM port. And uh, you plug this into the console port on the back of the switch, this into your computer, use a terminal emulator like PuTTY, and connect to the switch. Um, it used the standard settings. I didn't have to change any of the console settings, so it was actually pretty simple from that standpoint to get into the command line interface. Uh, once I was in, it was a little bit more difficult. So speaking of that, let's jump into the command line interface. Let's look at what the setup process was like, and then uh, we'll close it out. Okay, so we're about three or four minutes into the boot process here. Um, as you can see, it's not exactly plug it in and go. Uh, there's quite a bit of stuff that has to be loaded before you even get to the point where you can start issuing the switch commands. I was not intending to do a full factory reset for this demonstration, um, as the initial setup process is really not very difficult. You tell it whether or not it's part of a group of uh, fiber connects, which is techni the technical name for this thing is not a switch, it's a fiber connect or a fabric interconnect. <clears throat> so you're going to tell it whether or not it's a member of a group of, a fa of fabric interconnects or whether or not it is a standalone module. Uh, you'll tell it what the admin password is going to be. You tell it what the fixed IP address is for the management port, and that's basically it. There's not a lot else. And we're logged in. Okay, so the as we previously talked about, this is not really just a switch. It's actually meant to be a management module for an entire compute system. So we're not just talking to the switch. We're talking to the management uh, system for Cisco's unified compute system. So what we have to do then is we have to think about what level are we actually talking to are we talking are we talking to the switch or the device itself are we talking to the computers it's supposed to be managing and whatnot so what you do to determine what you're talking to you set the scope um, before we go any further though the most important thing you can learn is the question mark the question mark tells you what commands are available based on what you have typed so far so if I had a question mark it'll tell me what my current commands are that I can do. I can connect, dis decommission, delete, you know, etc. Uh, scope tells you what you are talking to. So we can do scope, space, question mark. And it'll tell me what possible scopes there are. So I can see here, you know, do I have, do I have the ability to set the scope to uh, an individual adapter, um, a chassis, uh, ETH server, ETH storage, ETH traffic monitor, uplink. So to give you a little bit of an idea, the server storage, uh, the, all these ETH things refer to the Ethernet ports. FC refers to fiber channel ports. Uh, Fabric Interconnect is the actual device itself, the switch itself, although there's not really a lot you can do there because you, if you're managing ports, you're doing it here. So. Let's actually start by going through the licensing portion. You don't have to do this. This is not actually part of the setup. This is more for your edification so you know how many ports you have to use. So scope, system, and then I forget what exactly what it's called. Oh no, wait, I'm sorry. That was stupid. So we go up to go back. If we go to the wrong place, we actually want to go to scope, license. I can't spell. And then um, 
show. Uh, show what? We want to show file. Show usage, sorry, show usage. So show usage will show you how many licenses you're using and how many licenses you have. So we can see here, and this is great formatting, A1 job, Cisco. Um, Ethernet port activation package is your Ethernet licenses. Um, it will show you the scope here is which fabric interconnect it is because you're supposed to, in theory, have two of these for failover, A and B. So right in here, this is scope A. That's our only fabric interconnect. Uh, the default that you get with the switch just for having it is eight. The total you have is your eight plus any licenses. This switch actually came with four licenses installed, so I have a total of 12. So my used quantity that I have activated is four. So I've activated four of those of those uh, uh, ports as ethernet modules. So my license status is okay. And Grace used, so you can use ports that you don't have licenses for, for up to 120 days. This is telling me I have used zero of my days. Um, if I, for some reason, needed to plug in that 13th device, actually in this case, 16th device, because the four ports on the expansion module don't count towards my license count. Um, so if I have more than 16 devices connected to this, and when I plug in that 17th, it'll start incrementing days on my grace period up to 120 days. At that 120th day, that extra port will get turned off. Um, you can, of course, reset it back to factory settings and go ahead and do it again, but that's kind of a pain in the ass. If, when you have that many ports, you really don't want to go through and reset all of it up. So that's how you can check on your licenses. In terms of actually setting it up, the scope that we care about is eth uplink, so ethernet uplink. Um, ethernet server refers to UCS servers. It does not refer to general servers. So you gotta think in terms of the unified compute system and what its naming convention is. A unified compute server would be what this is for. A unified compute storage device is what this guy is for. An ethernet uplink is any other network device. So a non-UCS server, a non-UCS storage device, etc., etc. Same thing goes for Fiber Connect. You have Fiber Connect uplinks for everything else, and then Fiber Connect storage for UCS-based Fiber Connect devices. So, since all we really care about is uh, using this as a switch, we're going to go set our scope to ETH uplink. All right. So now we're in our Ethernet uplink. Um, from here, you can't quite create interfaces yet. Um, actually, before you create interfaces, the first thing you want to do is set it in switching mode. Uh, so show mode. Nope. Show. Uh, show detail. All right. So when you do show detail in ETH upper link, you will be able to see what the mode is, right? So there are two modes, in-host mode and switching mode. In in-host mode, it is acting as the in-host for uh, the UCS system and expects there to be an upstream switch that will uh, provide the necessary information and have spanning tree running and all of that. It doesn't have that stuff running by default. If you want it to act as a switch, you want it to have spanning tree running, you have to put it in switch mode. So the way to do that is set mode switch. I already have it in switch mode, so it doesn't do anything. If you did not have it in switch mode, you would have a little asterisk right here, and then you would have to type uh, commit buffer. And when you do that, it's going to reboot the switch because it has to load additional protocols at the beginning. All right, so now you've got it in switching mode. You went, you did show detail, and it was definitely in switching mode. The next thing you need to do is actually create your ports. So what you have to do first is you need to change your scope because ETH uplink is the scope for the entire unified compute systems, Ethernet uplinks. We need this fabric interconnects, uh, this device's ports. Uh, so we want to scope fabric A. So again, we only have one device. It is the A device. All right, so show so show inventories no uh, da -da 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 -da. show port channel no
Where was inventory? Uh, let's try interface. I don't remember all of these commands off the top of my head, and I should have scripted them out, but I'm just rather would poke around. All right, so you can see I've got four interfaces configured. Um, so show interface will show you what you have configured. If you have nothing, it'll show you nothing. Um, to configure an interface from here, you simply type create interface, tell it one for uh, module one, which is the onboard uh, ports. If you have a, an expansion module, it'd be module two. So let's say I want to actually configure one of the uh, expansion modules ports is a, a uh, usable ethernet uplink port. So two, one would be the first port on the expansion module. All right, and then commit. So we got our asterisk, so we need to commit it. All right, go back up and then show, show interface. Boom, now we see that we've got this guy set up. And you can see here, license status, not applicable. If we actually go back up, uh, yes, up, scope. I can't spell guys and then show can't even remember I'm like a goldfish so you can see we're still not using any more of our 12 we've only used four so that's one good thing to think about when you're looking at different inner you know different fabric interconnects the different of these 6120s to purchase if it has an expansion module you don't need licenses for those and you can just use them Excuse me. So like I said, it's a bit of a difficult process if you are not sure exactly how to navigate this command line interface and you don't have access to the GUI like I didn't. But once you figure out the basics of how to navigate this interface, it's really not that bad. It's just, like I said, a bit obtuse because it's not really a switch. It's a fabric interconnect that is the management module for the unified unified compute system from Cisco. Um, so anyway, Let's jump back over to the table and wrap this thing up. All right, guys, so like I said, it's not that bad once you actually understand what the environment is like and what uh, commands are necessary to get the thing actually up and running. All right, so now that we've gone through the command line and we've gotten it all set up, what's next? Well, simply connect your SFP plus, either your direct attached copper cables or your optical cables from the devices that you need to attach to your switch and want to network together into the ports that you've configured to be utilized. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I hope you found this video fun. I had a great time doing it. I had an awesome time actually learning how to use this guy, even though he was frustrating as hell to get set up. If you enjoyed this video, throw a like on it. Also leave any comments or questions you have for me in the comment section down below. If you've got the same switch or a similar one, um, I'd love to try and help you out with it as much as I can. I may not be able to answer every question, but I'll do the best I can and point you hopefully to some great communities that could help you like uh, the home lab community on Reddit. Uh, so that's just r slash home lab, all one word. There's a lot of really helpful people there. There are a few people there who I probably wouldn't have figured this out without them. So thank you to those of you, uh, you know who you are. If you're new to this channel, subscribe for more content like this in the future. If you'd like to support future projects, you can uh, click on the Amazon affiliate link in the description section down below. Thanks for watching, guys. Have a good one.